Hi, I'm Dan. Thanks for checking in on DimGuard today. Um, so I issued an invitation about a week ago um, to start a weekly Q&A, and uh, I got the first question in. I only got one in this week, um, but it's a good one. Um, I would certainly encourage anyone who has questions about DimGuard or d, &D in general um, to send in questions. But if you have even broader questions, if there's, you know, I, I'll, I will try to answer any question you have. Send it to has.dan at gmail.com or dimguard at gmail.com. I'll get it through either channel. Um, so uh, you can also post it to, in the comments on, on the Kickstarter. Yeah, I'll, I, I monitor those pretty closely, too. All right. So uh, this comes from Kim A. I'm not going to give his last name because uh, he may not want that notoriety. Um and he asked, uh, there's some interesting or some very flattering beginning stuff about how he's been a backer for a long time. Um, but then we get to the question, it says, it seems like to survive in Nimgard, I have to have extremely optimized characters. What is your advice on character creation for Nimgard? And then he asked a, a second question. It says, is this true of other campaigns, say the Watsi hardbacks or Adventurers League? All right. So to the first question. Um, Right, so in 3.5 and 4th edition, if you were designing an adventure and you said, I'm going to follow the rules and guidelines for adventure design, but I want it, the PCs to really feel like there's a sincere threat of death, that was really hard to do if the players were highly optimized, if the players were really good at optimizing characters. Because as, a, as, a, as an adventure designer, um, it was pretty, it was very deliberately and well balanced. You, you really had to to know things like the like Tucker's Cobalt or trap management or or how to manipulate um, uh, uh, equipment inventories and things like that um, to really take the rules of of 3.5 adventure design and make PCs feel uh, like they could die. Um, and that was also true in fourth edition. Now. Fifth edition does not do that, right? So in fifth edition, the adventure designer slash DM's uh, tool suite is so radically more powerful than the the player who's developing the characters. Um, I, I have demonstrated that I can take a medium encounter budget and um, and following and following the rules of of encounter design CR and XP budgets in fifth edition, TPK a party of any level at um, using a medium encounter budget, a single encounter. I'm not talking about an adventuring day. I'm talking about a single, single encounter. We don't want to do that, right? That's not fun, right? That's not the purpose. The purpose of the game is to build a good story. So what is my advice on character creation? For Dimguard. Well, my advice for character creation in Dimguard is the same as it is for character creation everywhere. And that is find a character that you can build a good story with, right? Something, someone who is going to be, who's going to have a, an arc um, that when you talk about it and reflect upon it with your friends will be enjoyable, right? The, while playing D&D is great and, you know, the, the, Pleasure at the table or online now is is certainly great. Um, the real thing, the thing that keeps people playing D and D for decades, and that is not uh, is not the experience at that table in particular. It is reflecting upon the arc of their characters over time, right? Where they they played the same character for months, and they've seen that character evolve and transform and have an effect on the world and implement its agenda and overcome challenges and fail at times. That is what you want. Right? You want a character that is going to be interesting in that process. Right. And. Um, and you see a big difference between the, like there are a lot of people, particularly younger people who come in like, I'm going to play an evil character and their agendas are shallow and, uh, and 
they play for a few months and like, oh, okay, I'm going to go play something else. I'll go play an orc on Warcraft. Um, but the people who hang in there, the people who have been playing, you know, since they were teenagers and are now into their 50s, when you when you ask them, why do you play D&D? They're going to relate to you the story of characters and what those what the, the, the heroism involved in that. So that's what you need to keep in mind when you're developing a character. Right? You are trying to build a hero. Part of building that hero is understanding the framework within which that hero will operate. So um, with the Watsi hardbacks, that's pretty straightforward. Oh, we're going into uh, Ravenloft, right? Which is a, an undead... Uh, vampire ruled I'll build a Van Helsing or something like that right um, or you know um, Storm King Thunder oh we're going to be fighting giants I'll, I'll build I'll build a character with with a good axe to grind for giants or can, that can build a, a good story within the framework of a giant dominated uh, uh, story arc um, so that's what I say now you mentioned Adventures League, much harder than Adventures League. Adventure League, the stories are so disjoint, right? Um, it's just really hard to 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 predict um, the type of framework you're going to. Plus, um, when you talk about Adventure League, you also have to um, uh, infer that there's going to be a lot of DM volatility, right? You, as opposed to other other situations where you'll have the same DM for week after week. If adventure and you you can do that. You could you can take Adventure League into a into a home game and and we've done that and, and that's that's good. But but generally when people say Adventure League, they're talking about like convention play or or a uh, play in a game store where the DMs are are apt to change frequently, maybe week to week. Um, so it's really hard even to, to, to gauge, you know, because DMs have so, so many different idiosyncrasies. Some DMs really like to get in-character role-playing involved. Others are not comfortable with that. Um, some DMs really get into combat. Others prefer to, to just sort of uh, present combat in as, in as summary a way as possible to get on with what they consider the real meat of the story, which is the the stuff around combat, right? So um, it's really hard, much harder to do with Adventure League. Uh, Adventure League, you really just kind of have to look into yourself. So, so forget about the framework so much as as focus on building just a compelling character on its own um, instead of instead of trying to, to find, to think, well, how is this going to fit into the broader story? Uh, Dimgard is more aligned to the Watsi hardbacks, I think, um, particularly now, right? You, you're going to know that um, the, the broad, like Tyranny and Purple, you're trying to overthrow the Tofarian Empire. Um, encounters with gold, you're, you're dealing with um, drag, draconic entities, evil draconic entities. Um, but you can, you can design accordingly. Um, so that, that would be my, that, that's the first thing, is build a good character, build a compelling character, one that you can build a good story on. Um, and then as far as needing to be optimized in DimGuard, DimGuard is highly scalable, right? So um, if, you, if, if your DimGuard game is too deadly, um, you, you probably should talk to your DM and relate that to him. Um, now, uh, because what what happens in Dimgard, and, and Ken may not may not have actually read through these, is that you have like the base encounter, which is a medium encounter, um, and then there are these optional things that the DM can attach for more optimized parties, right? So. Um, so if the DM is presenting all those optimized options for a group of investigative rogues, right, um, it's just going to kill them, right? It's not going to be a good story. It's going to be a, it's just going to be a, a, a slog through combat. Um, and, and I will say this too, that even as the designer of Dimgard, 
I have fallen into that problem. Like in particular at times when I have remixed my, you know, I've had like a, a, a player drop out of a game. And so I've brought in someone new in the game and it has changed really the optimization of the party as a whole. And I have, I have been slow to um, adjust the encounters that I, I, I've been guilty of that myself. Uh, and you might need to, to bring that to the, to the attention of the DM so that he, he knows to um, reduce the, um, the number of, of those optional traits that he's bringing into the encounters. Um, because that's not, that's not the intention of Dimgard. The intention of Dimgard is really to allow the DM to present challenging stories for PCs at all levels of optimization, right? From the, the very low optimized combat guys to the very, you know, the real, you know, I, I've got my plus six action economy down, guys, at the other end, right? Um, and so you shouldn't have to be that optimized. Unless that's just the, you know unless the DM says that's just the game I like to run I like to I like to I like to have you know high powered combats and you need to be ready for that I mean that's 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 a valid decision on the DM's part but that's not inherent to uh, Dimgard is the point um, uh, but if you are looking for advice on optimization I can I can give you the quick rundown for fifth edition um, the first the first element is action economy. Uh, the, the, the very first issue you want to address is that your character needs to be um, your character needs to be utilizing a bonus action um, every turn, every one of its turns. Ideally, there would be several opportunities where he could use a reaction during the turn, but and you want to get to the to the to the bonus action every turn, no later than third level. You know, if you're a fourth level character who does, who's not utilizing the bonus action every turn, then you are not optimized by definition. That's the first thing. The third level, you need to be using a bonus action every turn. Um, also, somewhere in that third, fourth, fifth level range, you should incorporate. Uh, you should be. You should have reactions that are going to come up uh, frequently. Um, things like Polar Master, which gives you extended. Um, Opportunity attacks or repost, which is a battle master maneuver, which gives you an, an, an a chance to attack someone when they miss you. So if you have high IC, high AC and repost, right, you're going to be making using your action for that. Um, things like hellish rebuke, uh, which is a which is a reaction spell, right. So um, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to say, oh, I use a reaction every turn. That just doesn't happen. But but you should have a a, a wide set of, of reactions that you're going to be able to use uh, more than just like, oh, wow, they gave me an opportunity to attack. Great. Right. There should be should be more than that. Um, then we get into uh, the more extended set of the action economy. So I make sure that I have an out or a familiar at as no later than fourth level, right? If I don't have an Al familiar by fourth level, when I get my first ASI, I'm going to take uh, something that gives me a familiar. Um, the Al gives fly by help for free. Um, there are other, you can, you can coil a snake around your arm that gives you that, the help and other things too. Um, uh, I've seen good uses of familiars with appendages um, in administering potions, uh, which is you know a great use of action economy. I don't have to administer potions because my familiar is going to do it for me. Um, so, so that that's that's the action economy. That that is the the basis of high optimization in in fifth edition. Now, there is one thing that 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 can happen that you need to be careful about too, and that is you can you can get so focused on a lot of actions that you really gimp your damage output. So your, your per turn damage output um, should be about one third of the hit points of a typical creature that you are expected to face in one-on-one -on -one combat. So 
For example, um, if you're fifth level, you are expected to be able to face something like a... Um, most of the creatures who you're expected to face in, in um, one-on-one combat um, have around 50 hit points, which means then on your turn, you should be able to, to, to put out um, close to 20 hit points of damage a turn. Right, maybe maybe more like 16, 15 or 16. You know, right, and you don't want to fall too far behind that just for the sake of action economy, right? Um, and if you do those things, then you're going to be fine. So, um, just just for example, if you do those things, um, then things like healing become just because because one of the things you're going to do is healing. It's like oh. Uh, as part of my optimization, healing word fits right in there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I I can have a character fulfill that bonus action with healing word. Or um, like I said, you can have uh, you can have um, uh, familiars or unseen servants that administer potions of healing. Um, and so uh, it fits well into. But if, if you follow those two principles, maximizing action economy while making sure your damage output is sufficient, everything else just sort of falls into place along the, the, the optimization curve. All right, so I hope to hear from uh, at least someone else before next week. Um, and I will try, like I say, my intention is to do this about once a week. Um, and uh, thanks again for stopping into Dimgarden.